Hi guys, welcome to a high yield review for the cardiology module. We're going to be reviewing pharmacology, microbiology, and pathology in this review session. Um, this review session is set up as a matching game rather than question and answers. Um, so how I would recommend you use this review session is I will first show you a slide without the answers. Um, try to pause on that slide and try and answer the questions first yourself. Once you're done answering them, unpause the video and um, you can then hear the discussion um, and the answers for that slide. So let's get started. So we're going to start with pharmacology. We'll have five slides on pharmacology. So this is the blank slide without any of the answers. Feel free to pause here once you're ready. Unpause and um, listen to the answers. So let's discuss this hydrochlorothiazide. Remember, it's your thiazide diuretic. Thiazide diuretics um, are great for decreasing afterload. So um, one of the answers in this case is A that thiazide diuretics help to decrease afterload. We use this for hypertension. And one of the things we see with hydrochlorothiazide is that we see a decrease um, in that resistance in six to eight weeks. It's not instantaneous, it's in six to eight weeks. Another thing we see with hydrochlorothiazide is that these drugs are contraindicated in diabetic patients. Um, they open the potassium channels, which will um, decrease insulin release in our beta cells. So you don't want to watch out for that. Furosemide is our loop diuretic. It's great to decrease preload. Um, this is used in cases of malignant hypertension, um, heart failure, and renal failure. And then spironolactone is um, option B. Spironolactone decreases mortality um, in end-stage heart failure because it antagonizes aldosterone. Any drug that we're gonna see will, um, antagonizes aldosterone will help to decrease mortality um, and reduce remodeling, essentially reducing the fibrosis in the heart. Great, so next slide is on vasodilators. Again, feel free to pause, try to an answer, and then we'll get into the discussion. So vasodilators, nitroprusside. Nitroprusside is your drug of choice for severe heart failure. So I have it down here, it's option D. It's the choice of drug for severe heart failure. Um, it acts on the veins more than it acts on the arterioles. So it helps to significantly decrease preload. Diazoxide, um, diazoxide, I like to think of diazoxide as thiazide's twin. So just like thiazide, diazoxide is also contraindicated in diabetes. Diazoxide and minoxidil together are contraindicated in women um, because they cause hypertrichosis or excessive hair growth. But these are also good vasodilators. The next one is dilatiazem. Dilatiazem is our non-dihydropyridine. Um, so this is kind of like a scale of how our non-dihydropyridines and dihydropyridines work. Dihydropyridines selectively work on the blood vessels. Dilatizum and verapamil um, are the non-dihydropyridines that also can act on the heart. Verapamil works mostly on the heart. Dilatizum is sort of in the middle. It, it works on the heart and also exerts efforts uh, um, on the blood vessels. So dilatizum is A, it's a non-dihydropyridine. Um, it can help dilate the arterioles, but also decrease heart rate. Hydralazine is option B. Hydralazine um, is the number one choice of drug for heart failures in African Americans. It's uh, more of an outpatient drug. And uh, one of the very high yield things you have to know about this drug is that it has an adverse effect for drug-induced lupus. And the last one is phenylodopin. Phenylodopin is a dopamine agonist. You can see option C here. It's a D1 receptor agonist. It helps to vasodilate and also increase sodium excretion from kidney. When we lose salt, we lose water. Um, and that means it's also going to help with lowering the blood pressure. Okay. Farm 3 is RAS drugs or the renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone 
system drugs. Enalapril. Enalapril is um, your ACE inhibitor. Remember, your ACE inhibitors end in pril, most of them. So one of the things we see with ACE inhibitors is the adverse effect of angioedema, cough, because they increase uh, tend to increase bradykinin. Uh, we also see um, with pretty much all the RAS drugs, like we said before, all the RAS drugs that antagonize aldosterone um, actually help to decrease remodeling, which helps to decrease mortality by reducing the fibrosis. Um, so all of these drugs, um, along with spironolactone and also beta blockers, will help decrease mortality. So we're going to see now will decrease mortality by blocking angiotensin II. Um, all RAS drugs are contraindicated in pregnancy, and um, they do tend to cause hyperkalemia because um, of the decreasing aldosterone or antagonist effects on aldosterone. Valsartan, again, is, is your... Um, uh, is not an ACE inhibitor, it's your ARB, which is your um, angiotensin, angiotensin receptor blockers. And Valsartan does all the four same things as your ACE inhibitors. It, um, it causes angioedema and cough, it's an adverse effect. It's slightly lower than what we see in Elanopro, but we still see it. Um, it de helps decrease mortality, it's contraindicated in pregnancy, and causes hyperkalemia. And then the last category is a direct run inhibitor called alaskirin. Alaskirin um, doesn't really have any effect on aldosterone, so we don't really see the decreasing mortality with alaskirin, but it is contraindicated in pregnancy. Okay, moving on to antiarrhythmic drugs. Again, feel free to pause and try to answer these yourself. So before we understand these drugs, it's important to know what the ventricular action potential looks like and what the nodal action potential looks like in the heart. So when the ventricular action potential, remember, has the phase zero. The phase zero is the depolarization phase where a lot of sodium is coming into the cell. Phase two is kind of like that plateau phase where you have potassium leaving the cell, but calcium coming into the cell. So the overall charge is kind of balanced and we don't see much um, of a diff change in the membrane potential. And then the uh, phase three is the, another important one, is the rapid repolarization, where a lot of the calcium exits the cells, calcium channels are closed, so no calcium is coming in, so we get a net decrease in the membrane potential. And then you also want to know how the um, nodal action potential works in the heart. The most important one to remember is your uh, phase four and phase zero specifically, because phase four, um, it, it's due to the T-type calcium channels that open, and then the upstroke is due to the L-type calcium channels that open. Phase three is your repolarization, and this is simply due to your R IKR, IKS, or your potassium channels opening and the potassium leaving the cell. So based on this, uh, there are some drugs specifically that uh, work preferentially on the ventricular action potential, which is class one and class three. Then we have drugs, uh, some drugs uh, which work preferentially on the nodal action potential, which is class two and class four. So let's look at this. Class one is our fast sodium channel blockers. They block that sodium entry into the cell in phase zero. Okay, so we get a decreased slope of phase zero depolarization. There's three classes. There's one A, one B, one C. How do you remember this? Um, one of the cool ways to remember this is I want a quarter pound. So quarter pound is your quinidine, excuse me, and your procainamide with lettuce and mayo, which is your lidocaine and maxillotine, and fries and Pepsi on the side. So your flecainide and your propofenone. So those are um, the, the major drugs in 1A, 1B, 1C. And then out of the three, 1A um, has not only affects phase zero, but also has some effects on phase three. And you can see it delays repolarization a little bit here, acting on the potassium channels. Um, class 1B and 1C only work on phase zero. 1B tends to shorten repolarization, actually. Uh, 1C has the strongest effect on our open sodium channel. So phase zero um, will be um, the slope 
will decrease um, the strongest in with class 1C. Okay, the other class drug that works on the ventricular action potential is class 3 drugs. These are our potassium channel blockers, and they will act preferentially in our phase 3. Um, they help with delaying prolonging repolarization. And the drugs in this class are your amiodarone, sotalol, and albutalide dofetilide. Remember, your amiodarone um, is kind of like uh, the drug of choice for pretty much all arrhythmias. It's kind of like your, um, like when in doubt, use amiodarone. Okay, so it's a very broad spectrum drug that's used for arrhythmia. So very, very important here. Okay, and then we're left with class two and class four. Class two and class four work specifically uh, or preferentially more on the nodal cells. And um, this is what class two does. Class two is a beta blocker. So beta blockers um, can decrease cyclic AMP. And because of the decreased cyclic AMP, uh, we get um, a delayed slope of phase four depolarization. So we get a delayed phase four, which increases the PR interval. And then calcium channel blockers will go and directly block those L-type, T-type calcium channels. Uh, and you're going to see, again, um, the slow rise of an action potential and also prolonged repolarization. So we do see that increased PR interval. One thing I forgot to mention about the potassium channel blockers, uh, when you prolong the repolarization, what you're essentially doing is you're increasing your QT um, segment of uh, in your ECG, right? So you get a QT prolongation um, with calcium, with, sorry, with potassium channel blockers. And remember, anytime you get a QT prolongation, one of the adverse effects of these drugs is they can lead to your um, TDP, your torsades. Okay. Um, I believe this is the last uh, farm review. So this is antidotes for digitalis toxicity. Again, pause here and then we'll discuss the answers. So digitalis um, group is the group with our digoxin, digitoxin, obane, um, these drugs which are used for acute and chronic heart failure. Their mechanism of action specifically is that they're positive inotropic drugs which means they help to increase the contractility of the muscles, but they're negative chronotrope. That means they will have a negative effect on your heart rate. They're parasympathetic mimetic drugs, and they can decrease the heart rate. So they, they make the muscles work harder and push harder, but decrease the heart rate, which is great because in heart failure, that will make the muscles work harder, but it will also decrease the heart rate, which will help uh, prolong that filling time um, and we'll be able to increase our diastolic time by decreasing that heart rate and get more blood, pump more blood out into the system. So good drugs. They're kind of old drugs now, uh, but they have a lot of adverse effects, and that's probably why they've you know, been replaced um, by newer drugs. So one of the adverse effects we see is VTAC. Um, the antidote for VTAC is we give lidocaine and phenytoin. We can also see a heart block um, due to excessive parasympathetic-like act activity, and for that we have to give an antimuscarinic or atropine. And we also see toxicity and overdose and just systemically, and for that we give a digibind or a digifab, which are um, antibodies that can go bind this drug. Okay, moving on to microbiology. Endocarditis. Okay. So homeless alcoholics, we do see a lot of Bartonella quintana, which is spread by that body louse. Um, affects normal and damaged heart. That's Staph aureus. Staph aureus is the only one that can affect a normal heart. Every other organism um, can only affect your damaged heart. Um, so Staph aureus is your gram positive, beta hemolytic, coagulase positive, catalase positive. Um, dental caries can spread through dental caries. It's our strep mutants. Uh, can strep through, uh, spread through GI procedures, is our strep bovis, um, can spread through IV drug use, so it's staph and pseudo, they tend to be on the skin, so people who inject um, tend to get staph or pseudo infections. And uh, rheumatic heart disease is our group A strep or strep bio. 
Um, one thing with IV drug use, remember when um, people use um, drugs intravenously and your, the bacteria is introduced into the veins, it will first get into the heart uh, via the vena cavus on the right side of the heart. So the, the valve that we see more damaged with IV drug use is actually the right, um, the um, tricuspid valve instead of the left side bicuspid valve. Okay, myocarditis and pericarditis. So our group A strep um, specifically is um, associated with our rheumatic heart disease and that can give us pancarditis. So an endocarditis, myocarditis, and pericarditis. Um, our positive single-stranded RNA, naked RNA, or picona virus, is also one of the viruses in, in this family, is the Coxsackie virus. And with Coxsackie virus, we see um, myocarditis, and it's the number one viral cause of myocarditis. T. cruzi is Chagas disease, and it's spread via the red of a bug. It's classical presentation of myocarditis with a megacolon and a megaesophagus. So watch out for any kind of international travel to um, Latin America, South America, but is also in the U.S. now. Okay, four is Borrelia. Borrelia is a spirochete. Um, spirochetes, remember, they have that endoflagella. This one specifically is, uh, Borrelia is what we see in Lyme's, with Lyme's disease. Lyme's disease gives us pericarditis, malaise, fatigue, fever, chills, and our treatment for limes is doxycycline. Rickettsial diseases. So Rickettsia orientia, remember Rickettsia is the Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Rickettsia orientia invade vascular endothelial cells. Ehrlichia invades monocytes. And anaplasma invades polymorphic nuclei. These are all intracellular bacteria. But you do have to remember whether they're cytosolic intracellular or whether they're vacuolar intracellular. If they're in the cytosol, we can use our CD8 plus cells or MHC1 response um, for the ones that live in the cytosol. If they're in the vacuoles, we actually have to use a CD4 plus MHC2 adaptive response um, to get to the vacuolar um, intracellular bacteria. Okay, moving on to pathology. So this is a big one. I uh, apologize for that little spelling error that sure draws. Um, pause, try to figure out um, the answers and then unpause when you're ready. So vasculitides, make sure you know the general classification. We have the large vessel vasculitides, which are takayasu and giant cell arthritis. We have the medium cell vasculitides, are polyarthritis nodosa, PAN, Kawasaki disease, Boucher's disease. We also have ANCA-associated small vessel vasculitides or non-ANCA-associated small vessel vasculitides like IgA vasculitis, which is our Hina, Shaolin, Nodosa, or the ANCA-related, which are our microscopic polyangitis or Wegner's or truck straws. So let's discuss these. Uh, most commonly seen in young Asian women is Takayasus, which is a large cell, uh, large vessel arthritis. Then we have jaw pain with chewing progressed to blindness, segmental granulomatosis, and we see multinucleated giant cells on histology and mostly seen over 50 years of age or old age. Uh, that one is giant cell arthritis. Remember the giant cell arthritis and Takayasu both will look very similar histologically. So what we're left with is um, the uh, more symptomatic and etiology to help us differentiate between um, these two diseases. Okay, IgA-mediated injury, we said is our um, henoshaline nodosa, which can give us that henoshaline purpura, it can give us um, nephrotic syndrome in the kidney, and so on. Then for sinusitis, oral ulcers, glomerulonephritis, and associated with C. anca is our Wegener's granulomatosis or granulomatosis polyangitis. Wegener's granulomatosis, remember WCC, Wegener's C. anca cyclophosphamide, which is the treatment for Wegener's. Associated with smoking is thromboangitis obliterans or Bugere's disease, uh, Bugere's um, 
look at their French name and French people smoke a lot uh, so you can remember that and um, hepatitis B infection fibrinoid necrosis and rosary signs hepatitis B specifically very uh, classical with our polyarthritis nodosa medium vessel disease Strawberry tongue, conjunctival rash, fever, cervical lymphadenopathy, risk of um, coronary artery aneurysms in young child. This is our Kawasaki disease. Um, if, you, if you hear about a young child with an MI, like a four-year-old with an MI, it's probably um, Kawasaki's. This is one of the few times you give high-dose aspirin to kids. Then asthma, eosinophilia associated with P. anca is our drug straws, allergic granulomatosis. And then our P. anca, hemoptysis, hematuria, neutrophils, uh, fibrinoid necrosis is something you see with, my, uh, with your microscopic polyangitis or small vessel disease. Okay, moving on to congenital heart diseases. Uh, you have wide pulse pressure. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, pause here, and then we'll discuss. I added a few more answer choices on the next slide for... Um, answer choices that I had not given here, so hopefully you can review those through this slide. They're relatively less asked on the exam, I think, but you should still know them. So wide, press, wide pulse pressure, bounding peripheral pulse, and a brachiofemoral delay is classic with our patent ductus arteriosus. Okay. A wide fixed S2 split, S3 heart sound, systolic murmur at pulmonic area and a left or right shunt is classical with um, our atrial septal defect ASD. Cyanosis and a boot shaped sign on the chest x-ray, uh, boot shape classical with our tetralogy of bellow. Increased afterload and the rib notching sign. Rib notching sign um, is seen with our coarctation of aorta um, when the blood can't go down um, the thoracic aorta, so it ends up going down through our intercostal vessels. And then cyanosis, parasternal keef, with a wide split S2, and the split is because there's a delay in the closure of our pulmonic valve. And this is our pulmonic stenosis. And a faint systolic murmur, intensity of the murmur depends on the severity. Um, this would be our... Um, Patent frame and oval. The bigger it is, the more uh, the more severe it is. The louder the murmur. Uh, a lot of people are affected with uh, patent frame and ovals. Some are very small and don't really cause any problems throughout their lives. A pan systolic murmur, best heard in the left lower sternal border, um, is classical of a ventricular septal defect. And cyanosis without any abnormal heart sounds is transposition of great vessels. Remember, transposition of great vessels, there is no valvular disease. There is no um, any holes in the heart and the walls of the heart. It's just that the vessels are out of place, um, which your aorta is where the pulmonic artery should be and your pulmonic artery is where the aorta should be. So there is um, extreme cyanosis and um, without any abnormal heart sounds. Okay, valvular diseases. So again, pause and then unpause when you're ready. Valvular diseases, crescendo, decrescendo, systolic murmur, radiation to carotids, and parvus et tardis. This is your classic definition of aortic stenosis. Holosystolic apical murmur, radiating to the axilla, soft S1, S3, associated with rheumatic heart disease or lupus. This is your classical mitral regurge. Austin Flint murmur or diastolic murmur um, with an S3 is classic definition of your aortic regurge. Diastolic murmur, opening snap on expiration. If you see a snap, that's mitral stenosis. Bobbing head sign is something we see with aortic regurge again. Concentric hypertrophy, increasing left ventricular pressure. Um, this is something with, we see with aortic stenosis, and we see an S4 associated with this. And then cystic medial degeneration with an audible click. So a click is what we see in mitral valve 
prolapse. So snap on mitral stenosis, but a click in mitral valve prolapse. Okay, cardiomyopathy. Cardiomyopathy, um, let's pause and then let's look at the answers. S3 and reduced ejection fraction, they all point towards a systolic dysfunction or pumping dysfunction of the heart. If you see an S3 and reduced ejection fraction, you want to think to dilated cardiomyopathy because the heart, the walls get so thin and dilated that they have a hard time pumping. Mutation in alpha tropomyosin associated with an S4 and sudden death in young athletes is everything you see in your hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or HOCAM. Um, HOCAM is a diastolic dysfunction where the, the, the walls of the heart get really thick. There is concentric hypertrophy and the filling is not up to the mark. So your, the cavity of the left ventricle decreases in size and you're unable to fill the heart um, to full capacity. Autosomal dominant mutation in desmosome proteins, fatty acid, uh, sorry, fatty infiltration in the walls. This is something we see in arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. It's a subset of dilated cardiomyopathy, but it uh, preferentially affects our right ventricle. Alpha 1,4 glucosidase deficiency is Pompe disease, or which is a lysosomal storage disorder. And alpha galactosidase um, A deficiency is something we see in Fabry disease, which is another lysosomal storage disorder. You should know the enzymes that are missing in both, and you should know that both of these are associated with cardiomyopathy. Okay, and this is our last slide on general concepts and some tumors. Um, feel free to pause, and then we'll discuss... So hyaline arteriolosclerosis, granular and contracted shrunken kidneys. Contracted shrunken kidneys is classical of benign or essential hypertension, which is a long-term hypertension. Over time, the kidneys get small and shrunken. I do want to compare this to number five, which is hyperplastic arteriolosclerosis, where we see onion skinning. And we see a flea bitten kidney. It's big, swollen, and has flea bitten marks on it. This is malignant hypertension, something that happens more acutely. So make sure you know the difference between malignant and benign. Then we have early coagulation necrosis and wavy fibers. This is something we see 4 to 24 hours post MI on histology. Increased susceptibility to myocardial rupture. This is something we see three to seven days post MI um, when we have when neutrophilic influx infiltration is at its peak. Tertiary syphilis, sorry, tertiary syphilis is associated with thoracic aortic aneurysms. Um, and hyperplastic arteriolosclerosis, onion skinning, and flea bitten kidney. Oh, we already discussed this. That's our malignant hypertension. Port wine stain, distributed to trigeminal nerve, uh, is our Stooge Weber syndrome. HHV8 um, is our um, part of the herpes family, and this gives us Kaposi sarcoma in HIV patients. Bartonella quintana can give us bacillary angiomatosis. And then used as alternative medicine for high blood pressure is our cocoa flaminols. So that's what we see with uh, used um, chocolate. Okay, so that is everything in this review session. Um, I will be adding a link on the bottom in the description to, for you to access these slides. Um, and I will also be sharing a link of Ninja Nerd uh, for arrhythmias because I did not include arrhythmias in um, this review. So if you do need help with arrhythmias, definitely check out Ninja Nerd's video. It's the best of the best. Okay, thank you guys.